Good afternoon, everyone. I am George Chua, the 2016 Phoenix president and uh, the currently the president and CEO of Bayan Auto. I will be your MC and moderator for today's general membership meeting. Before we officially start the program, I would like to share with you the following committee announcements. The CFO of the Year Award uh, Committee is already accepting nominations for this year's search. You may visit www.ingphoenixcfooftheyear.com for more details. Deadline for submission is on July 31st, 2020. The Business Education Committee of the Phoenix Foundation will hold its first webinar for our finance and business educators on June 22nd, 2020, with the theme, Understanding How Businesses Are Coping uh, with COVID-19 Impact. The speakers are 2018 Phoenix President, uh, 2020 Phoenix Academy Chair, and uh, Punong Bayan and Aralio Grant Thornton, CEO Marivic Espano, 2020 Phoenix President, and Filipina Shell CFO Jeng Pascual, and 2015 Phoenix President and Ortigas Land CEO Jimmy Ismael. This will be followed on July 15th at 10 a.m. on Teaching Business Under the New Norm with speakers FEU President Dr. Michael Alba, DLSU Vice Chancellor for Admin Dr. Arnel Uy, and UA and P Associate Professor Marivic Caparas. On June 24th, the ICT Committee will sponsor its second webinar entitled Retail E-Commerce in the New Normal. Lazada Philippines CEO Ray Alimurung and Zalora Philippine CEO Paulo Campos will be our speakers. On July 3, the Financial Inclusion Committee will hold its third webinar on Strengthening Supply Chain Finance, addressing today's challenges, speakers Jin Chang Lai of IFC, DTI Assistant Secretary Mary Jean Pacheco, and Taiwan Association of Banking and Finance President Dr. Hank Huang. On July 7th, our Junior Phoenix Committee will sponsor a webinar for the finance and business students and your professionals with the theme, Adapting to Life's New Norm. Dr. Jasmine Vergara, WHO Mental Health National Professional Officer will talk about managing distress in challenging times. Katagan Online Project Leader Gina Hechanova will discuss enabling resilience in times of social distancing. And Natasha Goldburn Foundation founder, Jean Goldburn, will share the inspiration for Mind Healthy Filipinos. A speaker from the Psychological Association of the Philippines will talk on mental wellness. On July 9th, the Media Affairs Committee will sponsor a webinar on effective media communication in time of COVID-19. Speakers are Nielsen Media Executive Director Ernestine Ampere, Facebook Philippines FinServe Head Pat Del Castillo, and the Manila Times President and CEO Dante Francis uh, Klink Ang II. On July 15th, the Environment Committee of the Phoenix Foundation will sponsor our general membership meeting with the theme, Environment and Health in Post-COVID-19 World. Speakers are 
WWF Philippines Executive Director Joel Palma and PH Labs Chief Planetary Doctor, Dr. Ramon Lorenzo Ginto. Lastly, the Professional Development Committee will hold its annual mid-year economic briefing on July 31st. Speakers will be BlackRock's Head of Southeast Asia Client Business, uh, Vishal Agarwal, BDO Unibank's Head of Trust and Investment Group, Asset Management, Fritz Ocampo, and Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development, Dr. Alvin Ang. These are just some of our upcoming events. For complete updates, please log on to our website at www.phoenix.org.ph and follow our various social media accounts as shown on your screen. We would also like to thank our year-round sponsors. We have Platinum uh, sponsor, Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation, Diamond sponsor, ABS-CBN Broadcasting Corporation and San Miguel Corporation, Gold sponsor, BDO Unibank and PNA Grant Thornton, and our minor sponsor is NGCP and Santa Lucia Land. Once again, thank you to our sponsors. And now we have our National Affairs Committee announcement to be made by Mr. Eduardo Yap, our Chairman of the National Affairs Committee. Eddie, go ahead. Good afternoon. Can you... Uh... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to make this report to you. We face a crisis unlike anything the world has seen, according to the IMF. Um, aside from stimulus support, one other way to recover is to remove the stumbling block to economic growth posed by severe traffic congestion and public transportation in a efficiency. Uh, let me share with you a slide. Uh, let me share with you a slide. Okay. Here we are. Okay. So this, uh, this, this slide shows the problem. Uh, as you know, the uh, traffic congestion and public transportation inefficiency have been causing economic productivity losses estimated at 3 billion pesos per day or 1.1 trillion pesos per annum, equivalent to a huge 6.5% of GDP. Now I'm pleased to inform you that Phoenix is helping alleviate this great problem. Yes, Phoenix is. Now, uh, the Inquirer front page headline treatment to the ongoing ETSA transformation for buses show you the great importance attached to this reform. Now, the next slide will show you the new normal, okay? With the new busway at the innermost lane, I took the bus from Etsa North Avenue to Ayala, Makati. It took only 27 minutes, unlike before. Now, um, what happened was before this, on May 10, I published an article with the title, Don't Waste a Crisis. Essentially, I said that a return to the status quo ante is not acceptable to the public and reiterated my uh, advocacy uh, of uh, five years ago 
that uh, a new busway is needed and that the, uh, this COVID crisis is the uh, opportunity to experiment this new system. So, um, you know, the Phoenix board made a timely intervention, the right push at the right time. And after the endorsement of NAP, the board with the leadership of President Jeng Pascual had the advocacy approved by the board. So following that, what happened was NAC held a webinar wherein I presented my advocacy for uh, bus system reforms. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, this, this was the flyer. We had two guests and then three panelists, as you can see. Now, uh, on May 18, I had a long teleconference with uh, Secretary Tugade and his team, and he, he promised that uh, he's determined to institute this reform and proceeded to do it. So Phoenix, again, uh, issued a public statement, statement hailing the bus system transformation on ETSA. And this was noted by the Department of uh, Transportation in a press release that it issued expressing uh, great appreciation to the, uh, to the uh, support being rendered by, uh, by uh, Phoenix. Now, this will be the new normal on ETSA. Buses will run efficiently while on the car lanes, if the uh, MMBA uh, does not institute more effective uh, uh, car reduction measures, uh, it will remain congestion, congested. But there is hope because Singapore has a model for that. Now, on the next activity, I would like to quickly uh, inform you is the virtual road show that was co-hosted by uh, Phoenix and MAP. And together with, with 23 other uh, business and professional organizations. Now, as you can see on the screen, we had all four, uh, the Secretary of Finance, Carlos Dominguez, uh, Acting NEDA Secretary, uh, Carl Chua, BSP Governor, uh, Benjamin Diokno, and then the uh, Presidential Assistant on BBB projects, Vicencio Dizon, all four of them in this one joint meeting. And uh, this, are the uh, participating organizations that you can see on the screen. Uh, I'll just quickly go through. Uh, now, as you can see from this flyer, uh, the speakers, the particip participating organizations, and at the bottom, the panelists consisting of myself, representing Phoenix, Vicent Victor Paterno of the Makati Business Club, Ambassador Diki Yuhiko of PCCI, Nabil Francis of the European Chamber. Now, <clears throat> significantly in this virtual uh, joint meeting, a joint statement of support for the enactment of CREATE Bill, which is the revised CITIRA Bill, was co-signed by 32 organizations and presented to Secretary Dominguez, who expressed his great satisfaction to, to Phoenix as uh, <clears throat> one of the co-hosts of this uh, uh, event. Now, I should mention that uh, this meeting was a blockbuster in the sense that 1,000, the full, the full 1,000 in Zoom was taken by uh, registrants and then over 13,000 uh, viewed the stream, the streaming of this event in the Facebook page of Phoenix. Now, uh, I would like to end by saying that uh, I would like to thank uh, President Jeng Pascual for quickly uh, approving this uh, unprecedented uh, joint meeting that uh, we had the opportunity to present to the public uh, covering the all important 
Economic Bounce Back Plan. Now, uh, we in Phoenix, uh, NAC, uh, are working behind the scenes and uh, we are doing our part for Phoenix to play a significant role and be re relevant on national issues. So to my colleagues in Phoenix, I would like to invite you to join us. Your participation will be helpful and most welcome. So as you can see, this is the chart of organization. Quickly, uh, the, my colleagues were helping in this committee and the next slide will show the active members. Now, thank you very much for this opportunity to report to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Eddie, for the updates. And now we will uh, move on to the next part of the program, which is our call to order. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third virtual general membership meeting of Phoenix. To formally open the program, may I call on our president, Mr. Jeng Pasqual, to call this meeting to order. Uh, thank you very much, uh, George and uh, Eddie. Uh, and good afternoon, uh, fellow Phoenix members. I would like to call today's Phoenix General mm -hmm. Membership Meeting to order. And then uh, we will now have our invocation and the uh, Philippine National Anthem. Thank you, Jeng. May I request everyone to join me in prayer and singing of the National Anthem. So let's start with a prayer. So Father God, all glory, honor, and blessing, all power and might, all praise and thanksgiving be to you, Abba Father to us all. We stand on your word declaring that when we call upon you, you will answer us and be with us in distress. Our deliverer and healer, we seek your protection for our families and all of us from the scourge of COVID-19 and all manner of disease and affliction. We pray especially for our health workers who tirelessly perform their duties at great risk uh, to themselves. We pray for all of us co-workers in the business community that we may perform our tasks with great diligence in these difficult times to serve each other and our country in solidarity and spirit of so social responsibility. We pray for all those in authority in government and the private sector that we that they may have all wisdom, competence, and strength to lead us and serve through this period of crisis with special attention to our poor and disadvantaged brethren who are struggling to survive. We pray for reconciliation and peace among all Filipinos as we come to better realize our oneness as people. In good times and bad, as a common dread unites us. So in acknowledge of our dependence on you and in obedience, we approach you, Father God, humble ourselves and pray, seek your presence and turn from our evil ways that you may listen from heaven, forgive our sins and revive our land. In loving name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We shall now have the national anthem.
Thank you. Once again, may I call on our president, Mr. Jeng Pascual, for his president's time. Uh, thank you very thank much, George. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Phoenix members and guests, and welcome once again to our June 2020 general membership meeting. Uh, this month, we remember our dear departed friend and colleague, Grace Palmatyonko. Grace was former executive vice president, past internal VP, treasurer and secretary, trustee in both the foundation and academy, one of the ICFC founders, and chair of various Phoenix committees over her almost 20, uh, 37 year story, even love affair with Phoenix. Grace was always present for Phoenix and for her friends, a presence that will be sorely missed. Let us pause a moment for a moment of silence for the eternal repose of her soul. Uh, this month, we also witness the gradual reopening of the economy uh, with a downgrade uh, from MECQ to GCQ over Metro Manila and other key areas starting 1st of June. Workers headed back to their jobs, which hopefully were still there. Construction activities resumed, malls reopened, and cars piled up once again on major thoroughfares. After two and a half months of observing quarantine, people felt the need to go out and explore and re-envision the world through the lens of the new normal. But the threat of COVID-19 is still out there. And we are seeing a resurgence of the disease in different places, both here and abroad. The risk has not changed. Therefore, it is our mindset and behavior that need to. These shifts in mindset and behavior are opportunities to adapt and remain healthy and competitive as individuals and businesses. Of equal importance are the opportunities we create to support and learn from each other. It is therefore uh, opportune to check our facts and learn from those who experienced COVID-19 firsthand. I would like to welcome our guest speakers, Dr. Edsel Salvana, Director of the UP Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, and Mr. Horacio Howie Severino, GMA news anchor and journalist. In line with our commitment to promote the personal and professional development of our members, our committees also held a number of learning interventions the past month. The Phoenix Membership Committee Overall Chair, Caloy Cervantes, Recruitment and Retention Subcommittee Chair, Jet Pampolina, and the rest of their committee members organized a very engaging fireside chat session last 8th of January, uh, last 8th of June, I mean, with our current ING Phoenix CFO of the Year, Toti Bengson. I wish to thank Toti for sharing his time, his insights, and his story with our fellow Phoenix members. And yesterday, uh, June 16, our professional development committee led by Ned Goseco and the Phoenix Academy, chaired by past president Marivic Espano, organized a very insightful session on coaching amidst crisis, where both coachy leaders and executive coaches shared experiences on how professional dilemmas during this crisis were addressed through coaching. We also had the opportunity to learn from our national and local government leaders. Last month's GMM uh, held on the 15th of May featured NED Acting Secretary Carl Chua, who outlined the government's economic strategy under the theme, Philippine Priority Projects, Road to Recovery. Our program and meetings committee chaired by Nanette De Jesus continue to ensure the relevance of our GMMs. On 28 May, as uh, Eddie mentioned earlier, we brought together the Finance Secretary Sonny Dominguez, BSP Governor Ben Diokno, NED Acting Secretary Carl Chua, and BCDA President Vivencio Dison to share the Philippine Economic Bounce Back Plan. And on jo June 11, we had the opportunity to engage Paranaque Mayor Edwin Olivares on his experience in dealing with the challenges of local government during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is, a dialogue, this is a dialogue that is part of the local government series sponsored by the Good Governance Committee chaired by Rod Franco in partnership with PNA Grant Thornton. 
Um, it is also one of Phoenix's key missions to advocate for business and finance policies and legislation that spur national development. In the past month, we led the crafting of or participation in the, a number of public statements targeted at reforms and measures to support the recovery of the economy. On May 28, we authored and presented the joint statement signed by 32 business organizations supporting the passage of the CREATE law. And many thanks to um, uh, our National Affairs Committee Chairman Eddie Yap and past President Dick Dubeladad for penning this. On June 8, we raised our concern on the inequities contained in the proposed Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 by issuing a public statement opposing its enactment as well as uh, we co-signed a separate joint statement initiated by MBC. We urged Congress to instead focus on pressing or on passing reform laws such as CREATE that are so badly needed to spur economic recovery. Crafting of the Phoenix statement was led by the NAC. On June 1, we issued another press statement congratulating the Department of Transportation with the steps, the bold steps it had taken to reform public bus service on EDSA. And this is what uh, Eddie Yap had already mentioned earlier. On the 31st of May, we co-signed a joint statement on the rule of law in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic initiated by the Judicial Reform Initiative. The joint statement was endorsed to the board by the Good Governance Committee. And on June 3, we co-signed the joint statement initiated by MAP supporting the passage of the ARISE bill, formerly the Philippine Economic Stimulus Act. Uh, there are ongoing discussions now on what, uh, which of these uh, bills uh, support uh, the, the, the recovery of the economy. Uh, and uh, we are looking at these because so far these bills have not yet been passed. Rush. As you see, we are busier than ever as an organization during these trying times. And we continue to look forward to the eventual recovery of the Philippine economy. The success of our economic recovery depends largely on the shift in our mindset and behaviors. COVID-19 was a perfect storm that ravaged supply and demand. Businesses with the help of government are reopening to establish supply, but demand will return only if there is opportunity and confidence to spend. The lifting of quarantine provides opportunity to spend but it is the change in mindset and behavior, adhering to health protocols and respecting each other's desire to stay healthy that will bring their confidence to spend. We all need to play our part. And by the way, if there is a choice, please prefer to spend what is proudly Philippine made. Thank you everyone and mabuhay ang Phoenix. Thank you, President Jang. And just for the information of everybody on our Zoom conference, there are a total of 157 participants as of now, excluding the uh, participants that we have in both uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook live stream. Just a reminder to all our attendees, if you have questions for our speakers, please type them in the Q&A tab, not in the chat box. We will ask your questions during the open forum. To formally introduce our speakers, may I now call on our Phoenix director, Mr. Domingo Go, to do the introduction. Doming. Good afternoon, colleagues in Phoenix, friends, ladies and gentlemen. In the interest of time, Please allow me to introduce both our speakers. First, an introduction of our second speaker to be followed by my introduction of the first speaker. Our second speaker for today, I am sure he's familiar to many of us who have seen him on television, has had a distinguished career both as a journalist for 32 years and a leading documentary filmmaker, having produced over 200 TV documentaries at least a dozen of which have won domestic and international awards. He was at various times a newspaper reporter, a book and magazine editor, 
and was co-founder of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism, of which he is still chairman of the Board of Trustees. On TV, if you recall, he was on a probe team for four years with Cheche Lazaro before joining Eyewitness, now one of the longest running public affairs program in the Philippines. For eight years, he also anchored the morning news at GMA News TV and from 2009 to 2014, he was editor in chief of GMA News Online as well as head of the social media operations for GMA News. At present, he is the vice president of GMA Network responsible for the training and development of its journalists. A proud alumnus of the Ateneo de Manila High School, our speaker finished his degree in history magna cum laude from the Tufts University in Massachusetts and his master's degree in environment development and policy at the Sussex University in the United Kingdom. On the, per on the personal side, let me say that I admire him for his advocacy for Filipinos to learn the ancient script called Baybayin, which he points out is a vital part of our identity as Filipinos. In an article he wrote in May 2019, he proudly points out that learning Baybayin and teaching it to others brings about an empowering fountain of youth feeling, and that the even greater emotion is the feeling of connection to one's deeper self, to the blood of one's ancient ancestors, a feeling of wholeness. But this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, he joins us not so much as a journalist or an advocate of Baybayin, but rather as a COVID-19 survivor after spending 11 days in isolation in a hospital facility. And so we are indeed honored to have the very distinguished Horacio Howie Severino to share with us later on his COVID-19 journey. Also this afternoon, we have for our first speaker, a person of authority in infectious diseases. And I'm sure quite a number of us read his Facebook blogs on the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. He finished his BS Biology Magna Cum Laude and his degree in medicine from the University of the Philippines and subsequently received his training in internal medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. He likewise trained in infectious diseases and tropical medicine at the University Hospitals Case Medical Center and the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. In 2008, he returned as a Balik scientist of the Department of Science and Technology. And currently, he's the director of the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology at the National Institutes of Health at UP Manila, and is an associate professor of medicine at the Philippine General Hospital. He's likewise an adjunct professor for global health at the University of Pittsburgh, and has co-authored over 60 papers in international conferences and has peer reviewed journals and written 12 book chapters and review articles. In addition to being selected as an outstanding young scientist by the National Academy of Science and Technology, he has been awarded the Outstanding Young Men Philippine Award for his work in HIV. Moreover, he has also been selected as one of the 10 outstanding young persons of the world as well as a young physician leader of the Inter-Academy Medical Panel of the World Academy of Sciences. In 2017, he was chosen as a TED Fellow and spoke about the global, global implications of the emerging HIV epidemic in the Philippines in his TED Talk. He has recently been awarded a Senior TED Fellowship in recognition of his work in restoring vaccine confidence and improving science communication to the public. We are therefore very honored, ladies and gentlemen, to have Dr. Edsel Maurice Salvana share with us today the latest issues in the COVID-19 testing and treatment protocol. Dr. Salvana, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm having, I've been having internet issues the whole day, so if I suddenly <laughs> drop out, I apologize. I can always send the, le the, the lecture slides, but uh, I'm going to do my best here. I'm going to start sharing my slides uh, um, now. Uh, let's see. Uh, can the call. There, there's a lot to cover, but I'm just going to try to go through it um, uh, as an overview. Uh, because uh, there is a lot of detail that's really involved here. Um, so just very basic, the disease is called COVID-19. It's caused by the virus called SARS-CoV-2. And COVID is really just a temporary name. 
um, from a timeline that started in December when we started to see clusters of pneumonia cases in Wuhan um, in January 2020, we started to see progression. Um, as the epidemic progressed in February 2020, unfortunately, the Philippines had a distinction of having the first death outside China. Uh, and then it took about four more weeks before we had our, uh, uh, another bunch of cases, case five and six, um, uh, four, five, and six uh, showed up uh, in, in early March. Um, and this is where uh, we started to uh, declare uh, ECQ, um, in uh, first GCQ in March 12, ECQ. Uh, subsequently thereafter. And uh, we did this at only about 52 cases. So we were one of the first um, developing country uh, capitals to shut down. Um, and uh, it's a good thing too, because if we, you look at the epidemics in the United States, where now they have almost 120,000 deaths, and we've only had uh, over 1,000 deaths, um, uh, the earlier you shut down, the better. Uh, Mexico now is shut down about 10 days uh, after us. And they're seeing 5,000 cases a day um, and, and, and much, much more cases than us. Um, so in April, May, after the TQ, um, we started to see some indications of flattening, um, which uh, gave the, the government uh, a, um, a way to start to decrease the, 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 the lockdown. Um, however, we started to see an increase in cases again. Uh, although a lot of this is backlog as well. So there's definitely been an increase and we expect this because of the, uh, you know, uh, releasing the, the lockdown. But uh, it's actually a lot more gradual if you distribute the cases over time. But there's definitely been an increase. So we need to remain vigilant. And now with Cebu in ECQ again, hopefully we won't have any other um, uh, provinces that need to go back to ECQ. Um, uh, as has been said, um, uh, NCR is just kind of pasang awa because our target is a seven-day doubling time and we just barely made it to that. So this is just uh, an explanation of why we shut down. It's not because uh, we're trying to completely eliminate the virus. It's very difficult, although some countries are trying uh, we're uh, trying to do that. There is no immunity to this virus. So, you know, what, until we get a good vaccine, um, we're going to continue to see cases. But what you really want to do with your um, lockdowns is to preserve your healthcare system so that the capacity does not get overwhelmed. And that's what we really did uh, during the, the ECQ is we try to increase capacity of the healthcare system at the same time trying to prevent it from being overwhelmed so that there will be fewer deaths. Uh, this is about coronavirus. is the closest uh, is the closest um, relative. It has about 96% of the genome matching, so um, that's probably where it came from. Um, the incubation period is about five days, and the usual symptoms are fever, cough, uh, colds, uh, sore throat. Uh, if it's a little worse, then you can get shortness of breath. If you look, this, this table is actually kind of busy, but it's very, very common to see fever. But again, these are from hospitalized cases. So these are more severe. We know that there are people, 80% of people who have mild symptoms and controversially, there are people with very few symptoms or are completely asymptomatic. We're not gonna go into that today. Now, the main uh, mode of transmission remains respiratory droplet, which is about three to six feet before the droplets fall out. There is some evidence of airborne um, transmission, especially in hospitals where they do aerosolizing procedures, but the vast majority will still be three to six feet. And that is why um, if you do um, uh, social distance or physical distancing of about three feet, then you actually decrease the risk of acquisition by about 80%. Uh, universal masking will decrease the risk by 85% and a face shield will decrease it by 78%. If you combine all three, then you can decrease the risk by more than 90%. Uh, the uh, overall mortality has been evolving now that we're testing more mild symptoms. It seems to be about 0.5 to 1.5%, but without any immunity, that's And even a 0.5% mortality of 70% of our population is about 3 million people. So that is still going to be uh, a, a bad number of, uh, of people that will be affected uh, if we're not careful. This is much more transmissible than MERS and SARS as well. 
So age distribution, uh, most people you can see uh, between the ages of 40 to 79 still get it. Um, very few above uh, below 19 years old. But I think this is also an artifact of the fact that uh, we were testing people who had more severe symptoms. And we know that people who are older um, will have more severe symptoms and people who are younger uh, have mild symptoms or may not have any symptoms at all. We know that people above 80 years old can have up to a 15% mortality rate, uh, which is pretty severe. Um, whereas those between the ages of uh, uh, 19 to uh, 10 to 60 to 70 years old, um, it, the average of that is about 1%. Below nine years old, it's rarely fatal, although we are seeing some problems with severe disease. Um, the other thing that predisposes to death are uh, pre-existing illnesses, just like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and chronic respiratory disease. Now, what is the status of treatment and vaccination? Now, there's been a lot of drugs that are being studied right now. So remdesivir, uh, which has been approved in the United States, has a modest effect. It decreases the length of stay. And everyone is aware now of uh, last night's announcement that dexamethasone actually decreased deaths by one third in ventilated patients and by about one fifth in those requiring oxygen, but it had no effect on those with mild disease. So, you know, dexamethasone itself being a corticosteroid can be harmful and increase your risk of infection as a matter of fact. So this is not a preventive treatment. This is a treatment that we give to people who have overactive immune systems caused by the virus. So you're trying to modulate the uh, immune system so that it doesn't overreact. And this is what the dexamethasone is doing. This is almost like a last ditch effort because again, dexamethasone is bad for your immune system. And what you're really trying to do is to try to modulate it so that it doesn't attack your body as much. Uh, there are also combination treatments. There are drugs called monoclonal. where the, the, the sites of um, action of these drugs are. Uh, you can see here, uh, we don't have camostat or arbitol here, but chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine at the different uh, stages of the life cycle, um, particularly with membrane fusion and endocytosis, it does have some effect on the entry of the virus. Um, you can see lower down lopinavir, ritonavir, ribavirin, remdesivir, and favipiravir um, act on the viral uh, RNA-dependent uh, polymerase. And so these are all in clinical trials. Uh, going back to the, uh, to the slide before. Oops, sorry about that. I think I got cut cut off. Um, let me let me share again. Um, I think I got cut off. Share the screen again. Okay, apologies for that. Um, so. Um, this is a list of the vaccines that uh, are in clinical trials. There's over 120 um, kinds of vaccines that have been discovered. Eight of them are in clinical trials. Uh, one of them, which is the Moderna vaccine, is going into a phase three clinical trial by July. And so uh, we expect that there might actually be good results of that by September. And they're already starting to manufacture this for for, for public use. And so if it shows that the phase threes look okay, uh, we might have a vaccine for public distribution by September. So everyone is actually keeping their fingers crossed on that. Um, again, this is the vaccine candidate and there's over 120 vaccine molecules. Uh, then very briefly, just the tests that are so 
uh, very um, controversial, uh, the RT-PCR test and the antibody test. Uh, right now, uh, RT-PCR is really the um, for acute disease. So anybody who has symptoms um, should actually be tested with an RT-PCR. Um, the antibody tests uh, are not as sensitive in people who are acutely ill. Uh, the other problem with the RT-PCR, though, it, it does not distinguish between infectious disease virus and remnants, viral remnants. So this is not something we use as a test for cure anymore. Um, it does need a BSL-2 facility. Uh, you know, the, the UBNIH test, the gene experts, Sancho, these are all RT-PCRs. Um, and there are other formats that are on the way. Um, the advantages are, this is a standard for diagnosis. Uh, it will pick up pre-symptomatic people who don't have symptoms yet, but will have symptoms in about two to three days. This is a known technology. It's very, very specific. So very few false positives. However, it's expensive. Even the nasal swab that we do will miss about one third of COVID positive patients. It's not something we use as a test for cure anymore. And it is prone to contamination if the lab is not very good at what it's doing. So what does a positive RT-PCR mean? If it's, well, you hope it's a true positive. Sometimes it can be a contaminant. Sometimes it can be inhaled virus that will not actually lead to disease. This is like what you hear with a dog in Hong Kong being positive, the inhaling niya yung sa master niya. Or residual infection, and now we know that these are not actually um, uh, contagious anymore. So if it's negative, it could be a true negative, or you did the test too early. We know that if you do the test uh, at least uh, before three days from exposure, no, I mean after three days of exposure, um, you might not actually get a positive result because the amount of virus is not high enough. or IgG or both, this is best used uh, at uh, seven days uh, of symptoms or um, at, at least seven days of symptoms. So if you use this on asymptomatic, um, you might have this quickly, BRNT, we don't have, it's not practical, it's not something we're going to use. ELISA, which is coming, which actually there's at least a couple of ELISAs that are present now. Um, this is lab-based, accurate, 99% sensitive, 100% specific, if done 14 days after the onset of symptoms. Uh, the rapid point of care test, um, right now we've had some issues with sensitivity, especially if you use it 14 days before uh, the onset of symptoms, and it seems like there's only one or two kits that are actually um, uh, more than 90% sensitive and specific, uh, which is what uh, has been set by the latest uh, department memorandum. Uh, you can look at FIND, uh, which is the a WHO affiliated lab, uh, to see how accurate these antibody tests are. But I would caution you in using rapid antibody tests, especially the ones that are not properly validated because there is a wide va variety uh, that uh, actually has failed uh, validation. So the advantages of antibody tests, even if the virus is gone, so somebody has actually recovered, it can still remain positive, but it remains positive longer with the ELISAs and not with a rapid antibody test. This is less resource intensive. It's a blood test, and so you don't need sophisticated equipment unless it's an ELISA. Uh, once validated, can be used to assess recovery. Right now, we're not sure if the antibodies that we're measuring are what we call neutralizing antibodies, which is uh, what you need to, for, uh, for immunity. But it will tell you that, that the patient has been infected, although some of them can be false positives. But these are on the way. Some of the ELISAs uh, can, are actually now measuring a very good surrogate for neutralizing antibody. So hopefully we can use that to say who is not likely to get sick uh, because they've already had it before. So watch out for that. The limitations are it cannot diagnose early disease. It's actually practically useless if you use it on someone who has only had uh, symptoms for less than seven days. Um, again, IgG does not mean immunity, but some of the ELISAs and not the rapid test kits 
uh, may actually be able to measure immunity, but uh, we're still validating that. It is prone to false positives. If the prevalence of disease in your population So what does a positive antibody test mean? It could be a true positive or it's a false positive because the IgM is cross-reacting with something, IgG is cross-reacting with something, or it's a defective test. What's a negative antibody test? Either it's a true negative or you did it too early, again, less than seven days from onset of symptoms. Even if you have COVID, it's going to be negative because you haven't had a chance to make antibodies yet. Uh, some people don't make very much antibodies, and so the, you, to see the line on the test result, you need a certain amount of antibody. This is where ELISAs are better because the ELISAs will actually measure the, a much lower level of antibody in the blood. And then, of course, there's kit failures. So to understand how this works, there is no good test for an asymptomatic carrier. Even RT-PCRs, more than three days before the symptoms are going to come out, it's still going to be negative. And even if you have symptoms, one third of it will be negative. But the rapid antibody tests, less than seven days, wala talagang magpa-positive sa kanila, even if you have COVID. So if you are looking for asymptomatic carriers, it's better to use RT-PCR, but even that's not perfect. So you really have to kind of COVID-proof your, your, just assume that may makakalusot. And then, then so you have to kind of COVID-proof your, your, your business talaga para kung kahit may makalusot, hindi magkakahawahan. Um, and then uh, rapid tests can be used for zero surveys and other things, uh, but it's really not something that's uh, a good test for, for people. People with symptoms or who were exposed to known cases is RT-PCR and the antibody test Actually, now we don't even need testing to clear for quarantine because we know that 10 days after the onset of symptoms, most people will no longer be infectious, even if their uh, even if their antibody uh, even if uh, even if their RT PCR is still positive because that's already dead virus. Um, and then, some for serum surveys and convalescent serum donation. I'm not going to go through this. This is just the PSMID algorithm that says that the only test you really need to clear someone for work is to ask them about symptoms in the last 14 days. And if they did not have symptoms in the last 14 days, then you already eliminate 85% of the potential transmission. And any other test on top of that um, uh, is, is not cost effective. Um, you can do an RT-PCR if you want, but it's expensive and it won't catch more than half of your asymptomatic uh, carriers. Uh, and again, the rapid antibody test, if you decide to do that, it's really something you should look at uh, afterwards, 14 days from symptom onset, because it's not going to be positive early on. And you should use a validated test. Uh, so how to restart work? Um, you know, this has already been uh, discussed by a lot. Again, symptoms is very, very important. All symptomatic workers should be tested with RT-PCR. No need to test anyone who is asymptomatic as long as they didn't have any contact with anyone in the last 14 days who had RT-PCR positive COVID-19. Um, and then, uh, again, you... It's impossible to capture all asymptomatic carriers, even with the tests that we have. So we need to social distance, universal masking, staggered shifts, um, and then uh, basically you have to re do temperature and symptom checks every day. Anyone who becomes asymptomatic should be isolated and tested with RT-PCR, and close contacts of RT-PCR need to be isolated and quarantined. And uh, just very briefly, these are the things you can do to protect your company. It's really, there's a hierarchy of controls. The masks, the PPE, these are at the very bottom. But very important is that the workplace needs to be engineered. Um, there's like one-way flow. If you can keep your workers on site rather than having to commute back and forth daily, again, it's, you know, the cost is, is, is considerable as well. Uh, as well. But uh, these are the things that you can do to minimize the risk of transmission. 
So for the foreseeable future, there's no immunity until a vaccine arrives. Work from home is still best. If transport issues can be resolved, you can bring them back to the physical office. Airflow, ventilation, distancing, mass sanitation are the most re relevant concerns, and we really have to be innovative in these trying times. Um, there are other tests that are on the way, including antigen tests that need to be validated. I'm not going to go through these because uh, we don't really have much time. So in summary, COVID-19 is a worldwide challenge, a major impact on work. Symptom screen is best to test for returning to work. So really no good test for asymptomatic carriers. Uh, we need to engineer the workplace to be COVID-proof. There are medications in clinical trials, and hopefully we'll see more that actually work really well. And the vaccines, we may have good news by September. Thank you very much. And Mr. Howie Severino. Uh, oh. So ca can I now present uh, Mr. Howie Severino? Howie, you may take the floor. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Phoenix, for uh, uh, inviting me, and I'm very honored to be here. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Salvana for that very insightful and informative presentation. I want to thank uh, Dr. Salvana for his service to the public for the past several months. Uh, he's been tireless, uh, not just in making presentations like this, but on, I, we follow him on Twitter and uh, in social media. He's not afraid of controversy, by the way, and, and debate and, and argument. And, and uh, the people who are following uh, this, the unfolding of this disease really appreciate his frankness and, um, and his generosity in sharing information. Uh, Finally, I you know I want to thank um, Domingo Go, the person who introduced us. Uh, he didn't uh, Domingo didn't mention that that we were dorm mates uh, at the Ateneo. I was a high school dormer and he was a college dormer. So if you uh, if you can uh, indulge this personal aside, uh, I didn't know uh, Domingo when he was a uh, you know as a respected uh, banking executive. So my sharpest memory of Domingo was as a uh, friendly uh, college student. Uh, walking around the dorm in his pajamas, uh, making wisecracks. So it's kind of a, it's kind of startling for me to see him in uh, such a kagalang galang na, <laughs> na situation. So I had to mention that Domingo. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm going to switch now. I'm going to share the the screen now uh, with my uh, presentation. All right, as as uh, as Domingo mentioned, uh, I've. I've been a journalist for the past uh, 32 years, and uh, but it wasn't all in television. Uh, I've been doing a documentary uh, with GMA uh, for the past, um, let me see, uh, 18 years. So I've had uh, I had a journalism career even before television. I was working in in print, and also more recently, I've been I've done a lot of uh, online journalism. Uh, the difference with television is that it's a lot more physical. It's a lot more, uh, you, you really have to get the pictures. You have to need, you need video. Uh, when I was working on the newspaper, you could sit in your bedroom and do a dozen phone calls and, and be able to put together a good story. Same thing with working online, no, but television is, is, is different. Um, so, you know, these, these are the kinds of activities that you need to do uh, when doing a television. You know, we, do, we cover stories underwater. We cover stories on top of the water. Here I am uh, kayaking uh, in the Estero. Uh, in Manila. All this is just to say that um, I've been physically fit uh, for almost my entire life. Uh, and I have to be physically fit for, for this job. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any preconditions. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I'm, you know, I think I have a fairly good uh, weight uh, uh, status, uh, etc. So, the cautionary tale is that anybody can get this disease. Uh, so there's no one can be complacent, even if you think your, you know, your uh, your immunity system is strong and you're a physically fit person and you have no preconditions. I got it, uh, and now uh, because of the documentary I did on on being a patient and uh, a COVID survivor, uh, I'm almost as well known now as being a COVID patient as I was as a, as a journalist before getting this uh, disease, but so be it. You know, this is this is not a role I, I asked for, but uh, I embrace it. So I've kind of become 
sort of a poster boy for this for this disease because not everyone who's gotten this disease and recovered uh, have been willing to talk about it uh, openly. Um, but uh, I felt uh, fairly early on that uh, number one, I needed to be transparent so that people who have uh, had interactions with me could easily do contact tracing and figure out whether they had close contact with me during the incubation period. Um, and uh, at the same time, gusto ko unahan yung mga chismis, no? I mean, after all, I, I appear on TV, so uh, kung magkaroon ng chismis, baka mali pa yung mga lumabas na information. So very early on, I decided to disclose to the public and to my neighbors. That was very important that, you know, I needed to be accepted by uh, the co my community. Uh, and they were very understanding because they had they didn't know uh, that I had it. Uh, so I was the first one to tell them that I had this, uh, that I was uh, feeling some symptoms, and but I was taking precautions. My family was taking precautions, and I and I was updating them the whole time. So I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't experience any discrimination from my community, which which is different from what a lot of uh, patients and survivors have uh, suffered. No, this is a very a stigmatized disease, and even after you've recovered, and and uh, you know theoretically your your immune system is is much stronger than, or you're more immune to this, or let you're less likely to be reinfected than um, uh, than m most people. Uh, people are still afraid of you. So, uh, to me, one of the main lessons from my own experience is that transparency and early disclosure are important. Uh, even if it's not to the public, but just the people you work with, the people you, who live around you, uh, it's better to be honest with them than try to than try to hide this uh, disease. Anyway, I'm going to try to discuss my my experience uh, in in a few minutes. Um, uh, I I had a fever for a week and I was nursing it at home. Um, uh, and then when the fever wouldn't go down, uh, you know, the doctors in my family said, you know, that could that could be COVID. So you better have a checkup. So uh, I got a checkup, I got an x-ray, and they saw pneumonia uh, in my x-ray, and I got a swab right away. Um, but aside from the fever, I wasn't really feeling uh, any other symptoms. I didn't have the dry cough. Uh, it was really just the fever. And, and there was a debate in my family whether I should even be, at, uh, if I should uh, be confined in the hospital, because if I was not positive, if I was not infected, if I just had an ordinary flu, and that's why I had a fever, Baka sa hospital ba ako ma-infect? You know, so there's that debate within, I think, especially if you have mild symptoms, magpapa-hospital ka ba o hindi? Uh, you know, apart from the expense, uh, you know, there's also kind of the, the danger of being infected if you weren't infected when you entered the hospital. But uh, in the end, we decided um, uh, that I would be confined. This is where I was being wheelchaired to my room already. This is the first day. Uh, and then uh, I had a swab and... Uh, I tested positive. Uh, four days, you know, uh, my, the test results uh, came out uh, three days after the test, or four days after the test. And my infectious disease uh, attending physician immediately put me on a uh, on chloroquine, uh, 250 mg uh, every day for 10 days. You know, the dosage is important because there have been studies that higher dosages carry higher risks. You know? And of course, this is a fairly controversial um, uh, medicine, uh, but I didn't know it at that time. You know, it was, uh, you know, I got, I, I entered the hospital May 26, where, you know, the lockdown started in mid-March, sorry, M March 26. The, the, uh, the lockdown started in mid-March um, and I was hospitalized by the last week of March, March 26. And uh, I didn't know a lot of the, uh, I didn't know about all the drug therapies. I know a lot more now, of course, no, but it fair, I was fairly early on. Uh, that's fairly early because that was the first lockdown. Um, uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of information about these drugs. So when the doctor told me, oh, we're gonna put you on chloroquine, uh, is that okay? I, you know, I immediately said yes. I mean, I, I'm assuming my attending physicians uh, uh, know much, much better than than me. But um, I'll, I'll be discussing the, the controversies about this a little bit later. And I know that uh, Dr. Salvana touched touched on this. Um, but before I continue, uh, I, I just want to address uh, a a question that's very frequently asked of me, which is, "Alam mo ba kung paano ka na infect?" That that is often asked and. To be honest, I don't know. 
I really don't know because, uh, you know, I, I, as a journalist, of course, I, I, I've been finding out about this disease even when it was just prevalent in China. And when, uh, you know, the first patients were identified in, in the Philippines, my colleagues and I were already starting to practice uh, the safety protocols of not getting near our interviewees, um, you know, not, not shaking hands anymore, uh, et cetera. So we were, we were already being very, I was being very careful already starting the early March, but um, life was continuing as normal. Otherwise, uh, I even watched a movie. Uh, I didn't sit next to anyone, but I, you know, I was still attending uh, events. Uh, I wasn't shaking hands, but you know, events were going on as as normal. This is early March. I even attended the dinner for my um, for my mother-in-law, who was who was like 89 years old. You know, so uh, so I was doing a lot of normal things. So maybe that's where I got infected from somebody uh, who wasn't showing any symptoms. I didn't have any close contact with uh, any positive cases. So the short answer to that question is no. I don't know. So I think, uh, I don't think, again, it's a, a cautionary tale that you, even if you think you're being careful, uh, nobody, you can't, you can't, um, you can't assume that uh, you're, you're not going to get this. You can't be overconfident about not getting this disease. So, uh, so they were putting me on chloroquine, which meant that I was at risk of uh, some severe side effects, one of which was um, uh, cardiac arrest. So if they put you on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, one of the potential side effects is cardiac arrest and of course death. Uh, if your heart stops, then uh, especially if you're not in a hospital, but if you're in a hospital, uh, you have a pretty good chance of surviving, um, but uh, it's still very, very dangerous. So what they're doing to me now is, an, is called an electrocardiogram where they're monitoring the electric currents uh, going through my heart. And they had to do this every day to make sure that um, my heart was not out of rhythm because once it was out of rhythm, then that means uh, the chloroquine is having bad side effects and then they have to stop it. Luckily, uh, it didn't have, uh, I didn't experience the bad side effects of uh, chloroquine and, um, and uh, uh, I like to think, I like to think that it helped uh, in me uh, getting well. Uh, but of course I wanted to show this because uh, Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine became uh, a kind of famous or notorious worldwide because of uh, President Donald Trump when he started promoting it, you know, back in, I think, April. And then in May, he t told uh, reporters at a press conference that he was, uh, he was taking hydroxychloroquine even if he wasn't sick. He was taking it as some kind of preventive uh, medicine. And uh, which kind of uh, alarmed uh, doctors, I think, worldwide, uh, because number one, it wasn't you know FDA approved. It hadn't gone. It hadn't gone through the proper clinical trials. Um, it had all these side effects, which Donald Trump was not talking about. And of course, if you're not sick, you shouldn't be taking it, right? Uh, but so that's how a lot of people became you know became uh, aware of uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine and its kind of. Uh, cousin in the drug industry, uh, chloroquine. They're both originally anti-malarial drugs, but they've supposedly there's anecdotal evidence that they, these drugs have had some success uh, in other countries, um, but it's uh, uh, there's no clinical trials. So right now uh, there are four drug therapies that are undergoing global solidarity trials. Uh, Dr. Salvana mentioned this a little earlier, um, and the 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 clinical trials. Uh, uh, for these four drug therapies are being done in a collaborative fashion among, uh, I think, almost 40 countries and hundreds of hospitals and medical centers and thousands of enrolled patients. Uh, and it's basically to expedite or to speed up the, the search for a cure, search for a, an effective uh, drug therapy. Uh, see, see, Dr. Salvana mentioned some of these uh, drugs uh, earlier, so I'm not going to go through the technical aspects of it. I just want to say that um, uh, I, I've been doing stories on on this. Uh, uh, you know, people think because I survived this disease, I must be some kind of expert, which I'm not. I'm just an, another journalist or layman who's been just been reading up on it. But of course, I'm interested. I'm probably more interested in the ordinary person. I'm doing a story on this person, my former colleague, who's a COVID patient now, who is one of the uh, 250 patient. Uh, uh, 250 or so patient enrollees in the Philippines in the solidarity trials for the four drug therapies. Uh, he's um, being given remdesivir, uh, one of the drugs uh, in this trial, 
uh, he couldn't choose, of course, and neither, neither could his doctor choose. Uh, parang, uh, you kind of register with the World Health Organization and you're assigned a particular drug. So he's been taking it and um, he was a lot worse off before and he's got, getting better now. Of course, uh, the data is not in, so it's hard to say whether the drug has actually had a role in, in his um, getting better. Now, uh, you know, I want to say a few things about this disease. Uh, this is my hand. Um, uh, you know, I rarely get sick. You know, I, I, it's been a long time since I was last hospitalized and not for anything major. Uh, this is really the only time that I had any kind of serious illness. Um, and what complicates COVID is that uh, aside from the physical effects, there's a, there's a huge psychological uh, mental health aspect here because I mentioned the stigma involved in discrimination. Uh, it's also very lonely because you can't receive visitors. Your family can't be there. Alam nyo, tayo mga Pilipino, pag may pasyente tayo sa pamilya sa hospital, hindi natin iniiwan yan. That's why there are, are cots or beds or long sofas in, in a lot of hospital rooms because we expect a family member to stay with us most of the time, right? Uh, you can't do that with COVID patients because uh, you, they can't even go inside the hospital. They can't even peek inside your door to ask you how you are. So yung, 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 your only connection to them, your only social connection really to the outside world is, is through telephone, texting, etc. cetera. And um, when, they, when they couldn't find a vein on my left hand, they had to put the IV line in my right hand which is my writing hand. Uh, yung right, I'm a, I'm a right-handed person, so that's my right hand. And they put the splint on it. So um, I, I, I had a very, very hard time writing anything because I write in my journal and I'm a journalist, so I write notes a lot. And uh, I also could not easily make phone calls. I also could not, could not text. I could not message. I could not uh, email very easily. So, um, you know, this, you know, putting the splint on my right hand, I'm not blaming the nurses or the doctors for doing this, but it actually it actually aggravated my isolation. So that's an aspect of this disease that I think is under underappreciated. And I think um, uh, it's, not as, it's, it's not as studied as much, but it's a huge part of uh, COVID. And, and if we consider that the mental part of any kind of disease is a big part of your physical recovery, if, I think if we don't pay more attention to the, the mental health aspect of, of COVID, then I think we're not improving the patient's overall chances of recovery. So I've been telling doctors, especially psychologists, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists this, that we have to pay more attention to the mental uh, health aspect, not just of patients, but everybody. Uh, you know, you know this, this lockdown, you know, especially among children, they can't go out. Many of them can't, can't understand why. I mean, this has to be processed with them. There's a huge emotional, psychological and mental toll that this is taking on everyone. I'm sure you as, as uh, banking and business executive, you're you know, uh, thinking a lot about the economic um, toll of all of this, but there's a huge uh, psychological, emotional, and, and mental toll on everyone, even if you're not sick uh, uh, or uh, with this disease or not infected with this disease. Uh, you know, I know a, a couple of uh, other people who have uh, come down with this disease who are also hospitalized. We've, we've formed a kind of a little club of survivors I also know patients who, who didn't make it, who, who, who passed away, you know? But this is one person who survived, see, see, uh, see uh, Isa Calzado. And uh, she was telling me, you know, uh, after she recovered, she said, you know, I, I was on an oxygen machine uh, the whole time I was in the hospital and, uh, uh, and, and you never realize how, how sorry, you, know, you don't realize how important every breath is. And uh, uh, my big takeaway from my experience is that every breath is a blessing. Every breath is a blessing. And I can say, just talking to, just having experienced this and uh, exchanging notes with other survivors, uh, another, another survivor is, is uh, another friend of mine. Kababata ko to si Senator Sani Angara. We kind of went to school together. Um, uh, is, it's actually a transformative experience. You, you, you kind of appreciate, you know, the, more, the essential things in life a, a lot more. And you kind of, it helps you focus on what's really important. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. Uh, uh, you know, especially you know, if you survive, <laughs> if you survive, there are a lot of there are a lot of accompanying blessings. And you know, people talk about uh, PTSD a lot in you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's also such such a thing as uh, post-traumatic growth. That is, if you turn turn trauma into something positive, then you can actually experience some personal growth. And I think the country can go through something like that as well. And communities that if you go through something like this, like a trauma like this, you can actually turn it around and make it and, and, um, you know, and, and turn it to your uh, advantage. And I think that's what 
uh, a lot of people uh, say when they when they talk about um, you know creating a, a an improved normal. The new normal can be a better normal, you know, and then never let a, a crisis go to waste. You know, you, you, you hear things like this. And I think this has a lot to do with people, people thinking, you know, trying to reimagine society. This is an opportunity to reimagine society because we really, we really can't go back to the normal way of doing things, especially since, um, you know, a lot of experts are saying it might be, you know, might be two, three, four years before we get a vaccine. Because uh, the only way we're going to go back to our old normal is if we have a vaccine, and and it looks like that's going to be that's far off into the future. So we really have to reimagine a lot of what we do. Anyway, I just wanted to show a few shots of uh, of my frontliners. You know, they were wearing uh, raincoats uh, uh, the first few days I was there. And if you ask them how are you doing, and they'll they'll always say iton para ako na sa loob ng sauna. And uh, you know it's very hot. You know it's central air conditioning in the hospital, but they keep saying you know they're sweating the whole time. And it's very difficult for them to go to the bathroom because if they go to the bathroom, uh, they have to change their PPEs. And uh, it's you know and if you have a shortage of PPEs, uh, then you can't you just can't uh, keep disposing of them. You just can't keep changing the right? So sometimes they hold it in. If they have to go to the bathroom, sometimes they just they go to the bathroom maybe not once in a 12-hour shift or just once or twice in a 12-hour shift. And you know how difficult that can be, you know. Uh, towards the end of my hospital stay, they, they started wearing um, uh, professional, more professional-looking PPEs. I think these were the real PPEs. And I think it's because of, there was a lot of publicity about the heroism uh, and sacrifice of uh, frontliners. And so there was a lot of donations of uh, supplies to them and food and, and PPEs as well. I just want to mention my... Uh, you know, my wife, who's very worried about me, she she decided to hire a private nurse, um, see Gab Lazaro, who's, who, I mean, luckily for me, he was interested in documentary, and, and he said, he told me, you know, someone should do a documentary about frontliners, uh, and I said, well, that's you, you have to produce, um, uh, you have to be the one, uh, and I said, I can teach you. Uh, sorry. And I, um, sorry, I accidentally showed this. Uh, yeah, and uh, I told him, uh, I told him I can teach you, and um, and I I did, uh, and it kept me busy, and it kept my mind off my isolation because I was there was somebody I was constantly talking to, and uh, he helped me he helped me produce a documentary about what it's like not just to be a frontliner but what it's like to be a patient. I mean, I was shooting him, uh, you know, while I was tied to my uh, hospital bed. I couldn't get up from my hospital bed very often because I, I, I was attached to uh, my IV pole uh, all the time. But uh, he was free to walk around. So he was shooting his life as a frontliner, walking home in the dark alone because there was no public transportation, having uh, like uh, Facebook Live, FaceTime uh, interactions with his two-year-old uh, daughter. So uh, I was telling him, you know, you're, you're like a patient. You're in the hospital all the time and you're also uh, separated uh, or isolated from your family. So that's what a lot of people don't realize about the sacrifices of frontliners, that they're also isolated because they can't interact normally with their, with their families. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of this. Okay. Yeah. So I eventually wrote about him and after a few days, um, you know, I, I felt, I started feeling better. I was producing my documentary here the last few days before I was discharged. And here I am being discharged, you know, and I was surprised because as soon as I exited, uh, there was a long line of frontliners here waiting for me. They were applauding. They were applauding for me. They were congratulating me and cheering me. And, uh, you know, but I was applauding for them because uh, actually, you know, I, um, uh, without them, I probably probably wouldn't be alive. I was getting, you know, really devoted care. Uh, and apparently, what I what I found out is that this is what front, frontliners do for a lot uh, uh, all over the world for um, patients who survive because it's a big big achievement, especially in the beginning um, when there were more reports of deaths than recoveries. Uh, every patient uh, who survives was considered a, a big victory a big victory against this disease, not just a victory for the patient, but a big victory of everyone. Uh, and so this, this uh, it was a, another frontliner who captured this moment. Uh, uh, it, was, it was really uh, memorable for me. And um, uh, before I left, I left this message, uh, before I left the hospital, I, I left this message on the whiteboard in my room and just a, a message to the frontliners, you know, and, and the kind of, uh, you know, they've been getting a lot of um, uh, praise and, uh, uh, 
you know, and and honor from from a lot of us. But uh, ang sinasabi ko sa mga fellow survivors, fellow patients ko, I mean, you'll never know just how devoted and just how committed these people are uh, uh, until you've been a patient. Because dumo talaga makita. Because you know, we're contagious, we're sick, and you could see them, you know, uh, attend to you with the utmost devotion. And they're strangers, you know, they don't even know you, and they're not exact, you know, especially nurses uh, and and uh, and um, uh, med techs, they're not exactly highly paid, right? Uh, and, and yet they're, they're attending to you with, with so much commitment and so much uh, dedication. Uh, and uh, I, can never, I can never repay them. And you can only, you can only try, um, you can only pay it forward. You know? And one way I tried paying it forward is producing this documentary where I actually, um, I actually um, I honor them. Uh, a big part of my documentary about being a patient was really about the frontliners who attended to me. It's kind of the one of the few, you know, journalists are not allowed to, to enter hospitals. Uh, uh, but I'm an exception. <laughs> I was an exception of a journalist who was given access to a hospital because I was a patient. So so I decided to produce this documentary. But um, uh, even if I was discharged, uh, I had a problem because uh, I tested negative uh, after, I, after I left uh, when I was discharged. But then uh, you're supposed to get two consecutive negative tests on the PCR, and then I tested positive. So it, I spent another month in isolation, in quarantine isolation, even after, after I left the hospital. So I was in isolation until the first week of May after I left the hospital on April 3. And uh, it was only in the first week of May, I think it was May 5, that these frontliners came to my house in Batangas uh, to give me uh, the results, my the results of my last two PCR tests, where the, which were both negative, so which meant that I could be considered officially recovered, because you can only be considered officially recovered by the Department of Health if you have two consecutive negative results from the PCR test. And here they're handing me my results as if, you know, it's a diploma. I'm graduating from this disease finally and kind of entering like kind of the normal world. And, and, and since then, I've, I've been kind of been, been able to interact with my family. Of course, we still retain the physical distance, but I'm not isolated anymore. This is my son. So we've been biking around Batangas. I live in Batangas. And uh, here we are. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, luckily for me, I've been able to resume uh, part of my, my old life, which is you know very physical. I do a lot of recreational activities. I bike, I kayak, I dive, et cetera, I swim. And um, and uh, I feel very very lucky that I'm I'm starting to do uh, all of those things again, and of course uh, now I'm I'm <laughs> because of that documentary which has had like something like nine million views on uh, on YouTube and and Facebook you know I've kind of become a like, kind of a poster boy for, for this disease, uh, and then uh, one of, uh, after I you know one of the one of the great advantages of being recovered and having antibodies is you're able to donate plasma. So you could help others. Uh, you could help uh, gravely ill patients uh, with your plasma, which is considered a liquid gold because it's that's the color. You know, that's extracted from our blood. Uh, we know, you know, our blood is colored red, but then when they extract the plasma, it's colored yellow. So they call it liquid gold. And here, you know, once you donate, I mean, people, you know, the health workers are happy, the frontliners are happy because you know they have something that they can use to help save uh, other people's lives. And of course, this whole process was televised on 24 horas and, and partly to encourage other survivors to come forward and, and to help out and donate their plasma. And here's a, here's a poster. Um, and since then, I've kind of uh, adjusted my role at the network. They assigned me to be a safety officer, thinking that, you know, I have this experience, you know, I must, I, I'd be kind of, uh, I'd be not really an authority, but maybe I'd have some kind of, uh, maybe, or maybe some kind of moral authority or some kind of influence over my colleagues um, to be a safety officer. So I've helped develop protocols. And uh, it was, uh, Dr. Savannah mentioned this earlier that every workplace, every company has to develop its own protocols according to your functions, according to your business, according to the nature of what you do. And of course, we're journalists. We never really stop covering. And one of the things we do is that uh, we have to find ways of shooting material even from a distance and, and uh, recording material. So, um, you know, we, we, we luckily, uh, you know, we have training in doing this. And so we do most of our interviews now using boom mics. Boom mic is basically a microphone attached to a long pole. Uh, so to maintain distance from our subjects. Uh, and these are examples of that. 
Um, and, uh, you know, one reason why we sometimes we have to get near cameramen have to, you know, elbow themselves into crowds is because they need a shots of, they need close ups of the person uh, that uh, of our subjects and uh, who are being blocked by crowds. But if you, if you bring around a ladder like this or a footstool, you're able to stand on it while shooting. And with a long lens, you can actually get, sometimes get a better shot of your subject without getting near. So this is another way of adapting uh, to the disease and kind of um, uh, being able to do our jobs uh, safely uh, and still, you know, and still being able to get the same kind of material. And uh, of course, something we always have to remind our, our, um, our colleagues, our, my, my colleagues, is we have to disinfect equipment. We have our own tent uh, in the GMA compound for um, disinfecting our equipment. Uh, we disinfect ourselves, you know, before we get back into our vehicle. Uh, we disinfect our shoes. We disinfect our clothes. Uh, you know, this is this is not just to protect ourselves, but this is also to inspire confidence in the people that we interview, in the people that we approach, the people who see us working uh, in the field. We want them to feel that you know we're uh, even if we're there, uh, we are we're 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 making this kind of effort to protect them them as well. Uh, so you know when we. We, when we try to protect ourselves from infection, we are also protecting the people we are with. We are also protecting our families and friends, our colleagues, and the subjects, the strangers that we interact with in the field. So we want them to have confidence that they, they will not easily get infected by, by us just because we're in their vicinity. This is the kind of equipment that we give every day. We give alcohol every day, et cetera. Um, just uh, a warning that we got uh, from a medical director of a hospital. She was saying, you know, you guys are, you know, we, we see you on TV wearing your mask, but a lot of the people you cover are not wearing masks. So you could be infected by them. So, you know, remind them, remind the public, and maybe us as influencers ourselves, uh, uh, we should be reminding the public to, you know, let's not, let's not ease up on this. Uh, you know, this is far from over and we can't be, even if uh, the, the lockdowns have been relaxed a little bit in some places, uh, we can't we can't get uh, we we can't get complacent about this. Uh, it's still a long way off before we before we defeat this uh, disease before we overcome these challenges. Especially since things are you know think th the world is changing uh, despite this uh, disease, uh, even with you know and changing in ways that have little to do with this disease. I mean, in the United States and many other countries, people are protesting, and some people are protesting. Uh, you know, there's the social justice issues in the United States, and it's kind of spread. Uh, in, in other countries of the world, and they're exposing, uh, and, you know, and forget, and forget uh, social distancing in situations like this, right? Uh, 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 so uh, this kind of uh, increases the risk, although I've, I've been reading uh, some uh, stories about uh, uh, recent studies that show that uh, when you're outdoors, there's, there's a less risk of getting infected. But you know, if you might be outdoors, but if you're if people are not wearing masks and are interacting without any kind of physical distancing, then um, uh, you could uh, you you know it could you could it could actually be very very risky for you. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, you know, the police have been uh, and government has been warning us not not to engage in this kind of protest, uh, partly because of the pandemic, but uh, but. You know, uh, people have been protesting anyway. I just wanted to show this. This is they've been protesting uh, against the anti-terror bill. But notice that uh, at least here on in, in near the UP Diliman uh, campus, uh, they were protesting with physical distancing, uh, which is uh, actually um, which is another way. Of, this is another example of people adapting what. You know what they what, adapting a common activity to the safety protocols of this disease. So uh, basically, um, uh, what they're saying is, you know, we're going to protest, but we're going to try to keep ourselves safe as well. And I have to hand it to the discipline of these people. Uh, and I'm not saying all of them are like that. I'm not saying that all protests are, are 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 like this. But I think this is what we need to do. We cannot stop life. We cannot. We have to eventually resume what we were doing before, whether it's dining in, whether it's going to the office, whether it's protesting, whether it's walking around in the park, whether it's jogging and biking. But there are ways that we can we can do this uh, uh, safely. So anyway, uh, thank you so much um, uh, for listening and thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you again to Phoenix for inviting me here and uh, enabling me to, to give this uh, presentation. Thank you, Howie.
for for sharing with us your experience and it certainly has been very insightful no and if you don't mind maybe we ask both you and dr uh, uh edsel for some uh, open forum we do have some questions from from the floor no and uh, uh and if i may just uh answer uh, ask you these questions uh that uh were not answered uh, previously so i think since we're phoenix we always talk about money the first question from antonio innumerable innumerable uh was how much did the tre treatment cost you did pill health cover any of the expenses pill health okay because because i was among the first patients i was patient 2828 no and i got hospitalized in the first month of the lockdown. And I think this was the policy of, of the government before. Uh, Phil Health covered my entire hospitalization. Wow. I didn't pay, I didn't pay, I didn't pay anything. I didn't pay doctor's fees. I didn't pay for any medicines. They may baon pa akong face mask, alcohol, uh, <laughs> and may baon pa akong chloroquine. Uh, they gave me medicines. It was all for free. And I'm, you know, I'm very grateful. Although I know that came from our taxes, right? And, I don't want to. I don't want to assume this was charity on the part of. Uh, you know, this is this is simply kind of a dole out or a giveaway. Uh, you know, this came from our taxes, but uh, I'm glad it was used this way <laughs> because I benefited. I'm, I'm and I'm and I'm very sorry that they didn't. They they haven't continued it. I think, uh, of course, you know, uh, 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 resources are finite, so I I, I don't think uh, the Phil Health uh, still has that capability today. All right, I, I have a I, question. And, by the way, sir. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. One final point. Because you ask how much the treatment cost, it was over 300,000 pesos. My 11 days in the hospital, 300,000 pesos. Field oh. Health covered the entire it's good thing. To know that just in case you had to pay for it yourself, that was how much you would have ended up paying. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. So, uh, we have another question, but this time for Dr. Uh, Edsel Salvana. Uh, with the imminent approval of ELISA-based qualitative and quantitative antibody tests. Would you suggest that this method that uses existing ELISA equipments in hospitals and ambulatory laboratories be used to do massive targeted testing for suspected COVID-19 cases to either replace the expensive and tedious RT-PCR tests or even to use it to take up the slack caused by the lack of RT-PCR testing centers vis-a-vis -vis the population. Dr. Salvania? Yeah, no, that's not appropriate because our antibody tests uh, are not good for diagnosing acute disease. It still has to be RT-PCR for people who have symptoms. The ELISAs are better if you're going to use them for uh, testing mga populations to look for um, uh, zero prevalence. Ibig sabihin, how much has there been disease in a community already? And they're much better than the rapid tests for that uh, process. It's called uh, zero surveys. But you don't test every single one in the population. You only test a properly randomized sample. All right. And then there's from an anonymous attendee, doctor. Uh, what can... What can you say? To, what can you say to be included that uh, GQ, GCQ, the NCR, and other regions? But uh, cases of COVID nineteen are still raising, rising. Right. Yeah. So there's there's a few things that we look at when we decide uh, whether to downgrade, upgrade, or maintain uh, a region. And this has been fairly transparent, man. First of all, is case doubling time, um, meaning how fast the cases go up. Uh, the current doubling time for uh, NCR is about uh, 6.9 days. Um, kaya nga sabi ni, ano, ni Harry Roque na pasang awa tayo kasi we were just at the number na 7-day doubling time. Actually, the higher the doubling time, the better. So actually, pasang awa talaga. Kasi technically, dapat nag-slide back ng konti. But it was just a very small thing. Um, and so... Uh, that's one. The other is uh, critical care capacity, how much uh, we are filling up our ICUs. And ito yung naging problema talaga sa Cebu, aside from having a higher case doubling time, uh, they started filling up their hospitals. And so that's why they decided to go hindi lang man em ECQ, eh, ECQ talaga, because they were really alarmed about that issue. So each province has a doubling time that we calculate uh, along with 
um, yung tinatawag na critical care capacity. And this is what the IATF uses to make decisions. Of course, there are other considerations um, uh, depending on, like, for instance, Baguio has a very good contact tracing um, uh, digital app, you know, so that's one of the things we take into consideration as well. Uh, pero this is all science-based. There are parameters. They can be modified. The regions can appeal as well. Uh, yung sa Manila, uh, as has been mentioned, pasang awa, but also because we don't necessarily want to shut down again kasi grabe yung economic uh, ano, consequences of uh -huh. shutting down. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, let's see, I, I, there's a question naman for uh, Howie, no? Uh, Howie, the, it says here, no? And this is from, uh, uh, okay. The, the question is, uh, let's see, huh? I, I, So it says here, uh, Howie, that they were questioning, did you have moments where you had a conversation with God? I guess that was uh, really referring to if you went to a, a stage wherein you were hallucinating or something. No, well, well, I was hallucinating, but uh, I, I didn't need to hallucinate to talk to God. Uh, you know, you really, you really start thinking of what happens after death you know uh in that situation i mean to be very honest uh yeah. there was a point where i was delirious uh you know i couldn't sleep i don't know if it was the the effect of the chloroquine uh I, I i couldn't sleep for a couple of nights and i really wanted to sleep and i just felt very scared i was all alone and it got to the point where i thought i was going to die and i called up my my wife and uh, to say goodbye basically i was giving her some some billions, no? So I was, you know, asking her, you know, you know, if, if I die, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and I was, I was doing that, and and yes, I I started talking to God. Uh, you know, to be honest, I'm not very religious, but I was talking to God. Uh, I was praying, and uh, and I even promised that I promised all kinds of things if I if he if I survived, uh, if somehow I I survived this. Um, that was probably one of the first worst nights uh, that I, I didn't I didn't think I would survive, but I, I promised God that if if I survived, I, I would be a, a much better person, etc., uh, etc. Et <laughs> okay, uh, this is for uh, coming from Luis Juan Oreta, Doctor Salvania. Please comment on the news that came out today, which said dexamethasone reduced. COVID-19 mortality by 30%. I thought I saw that in one of your slides. Uh, yeah, so that's true for severe disease for people on ventilators. Uh, it decreased it by 20% in those who are who need oxygen but are not on ventilators. Pero it had no effect on people with mild disease. And so this is actually because uh, part of the things that kill people with COVID is that the immune system is on overdrive. Um, uh, especially for people with severe disease, parang inaatake yung lungs. So we give steroids to modulate the immune response para uh, hindi siya masyadong mag-overdrive. Now, the danger here is pag inisip ng tao, eh, okay naman pala yung steroids, eh, inom tayo lahat ng steroids. Actually, steroids will decrease your immune system. So baka mas lalo ka magka-COVID kung wala ka pang COVID. So this is something that we use only in, in instances where it is it will... The, the the risk uh, is outweighed by the benefit because there are risks for dexamethasone. So, so we shouldn't self-medicate, no? I mean, uh, it should be a prescribed medication as needed. Yes, lalo na sa steroids because ah. it can really harm you. So uh, while you're there, uh, we have a question from Feliz Mendoza. Is Philippines not capable of producing its own version of vaccines against COVID-19? What seems to be the challenges? Please enlighten us. Thank you. Yeah, so mahaba ang vaccine uh, development. Eh. It's all from yung na preclinical, pre you're doing animal studies, all the way to phase one to four. Um, uh, marami nang nauna sa atin eh, because they were working on MERS vaccines and SARS vaccines. Yes. So, I mean, we could do that, but it'll take us 10 years to make a vaccine. Whereas, uh, what we can do is collaborate with those that already have advanced vaccines. We can be a site 
we can think about opening manufacturing facilities here. So there's a better way to do it. Uh, and we are going to collaborate with vaccine trials that's already been announced. So in relation to my earlier question, Dr. Salvania, are you satisfied with the flattening of the curve in the Philippines so far? How can we flatten the curve further given the density of Metro Manila and Cebu and other big cities? Right, so that's really a concern. Eh? Yung, yung, yung the whole concept of flattening the curve naman is not really to, to kill, the, to, to be able to um, stop the epidemic. You'd like to do that, but it's very, very difficult. But there's no immunity kasi, and this virus is so contagious. The whole point of, of, of locking down was so that, our immu uh, so that our healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. Um, and so what we have to do is continue increasing our uh, healthcare capacity and then we have to do the things that limit the transmission of the virus because we cannot afford it anymore from an economic standpoint to do those widespread lockdowns again. What we're hoping for is ito mga localized lockdowns, kung may clusters of cases, uh, fast testing and contact tracing. And again, wearing a mask decreases the risk of getting COVID by 85% and uh, physical distancing by 80% face shield by 78%. So if we have everybody do that, we can keep the numbers low without having to go back to lockdowns. Okay. Uh, there's, this is a question from Naka Raquel Nakayama. Uh, Dr. Sarvanya, I understand that some COVID survivors have donated their plasma. I think this is what how we did. No? Uh, have these been actually applied to treat COVID patients? Yes, we've actually been doing them. Uh, most of them do okay. Uh, the, the concern lang is kasi ang hirap gumawa ng clinical trial for COVID eh, na plasma. Kasi walang gustong mag-placebo, uh, <laughs> walang gustong hindi okay. treat So what we're doing is, historically kasi, this is something that's been applied. And uh, it, will, ano, it will continue to happen. But yun nga, compassionate use. Uh, it's very difficult rin kasi if you're using plasma, you're harvesting antibodies. Iba-iba ang levels ng antibodies ng tao. Eh. So it's very difficult to standardize the amount of antibody you get from each person. But they are working on itong tinatawag na monoclonal antibodies, which are actually artificially um, produced antibodies that you can make in massive quantities and you can standardize the dose. And so these are actually being done right now. Um, hopefully, we'll have results in the next one to three months. Um, and they will be even better than convalescent plasma because then you can make them on demand. Okay. And this is a question from uh, Terry Magleo. Why is the percentage recovery nationwide very small since January? Paranaque Mayo reported 65% recovery in his city. Yeah, that, that's like with uh, what, what uh, Mr. Howie said. Na kasi rinirequire nila dati, dati to, na you had to have two negative RT-PCRs. And natural, nung bigla dumami yung cases, they were really prioritizing the ones who were new cases na yun muna yung RT-PCR natin kesa yung recovery. But now that WHO and CDC have actually moved to a time-based recovery, you don't need to test people anymore. Uh, if, you're, if you're well na and you've been isolated for 14 days, you don't need testing anymore to be called recovered. And this is in line with global standards. Kasi in Singapore and in Korea, they found out that after 10 days, the virus that you're shedding, even if you're RT-PCR positive, it's already dead virus. It can't infect people anymore. Okay. So as long as you have no more fever, no more symptoms, at the end of 14 days, you're considered recovered. You'll see people, a lot of people recover in the next few days. Okay, uh, one, one final question. And this is from Vilma Cervantes for Dr. Salvania. What is your view on government allocating much larger budget for tourism versus COVID-related needs of the healthcare system? Yeah, I, I don't know how to comment on that because I don't know the entire budget. Naman eh. Pero let's understand also that tourism is one of the hardest hit industries. Yeah. So I really think they really need a lot of help. I mean, these are people who are talking about people's jobs, people's lives. So I think that it's not an issue of giving some to someone and then conti dito. I mean, these are continuing things. There are continuing subsidies coming in. I think that everybody needs help. And any help that is given by the government to different sectors of society are just as valuable because we're talking about people's lives and livelihoods. Okay. I, I have one final question also for Howie. No? Howie, you're in a unique situation wherein you are a media practitioner no? in a very large uh, TV network which is GMA7, um, in, in what way do you think 
that the coverage of the news is it uh, uh, is it influenced by how the government wants us to uh, not not uh, uh, keep the situation under control, or do we still have the uh, responsibility to inform the general public the way it really is or the truth? No, I mean, uh, do you balance that out by making sure that the, the general population doesn't panic versus telling them the real story, Howie? Well, our, I mean, our primary role in society is, is to seek the facts and present them in a way that, so that people will pay attention and uh, have a basis for their decisions and, and actions. And uh, facts can come from the government. It can come from doctors like Dr. Salvana. It can come from people like yourselves. Uh, government is just one source of facts, and and uh, it's up to us to verify them. Uh, basically, the discipline of verification is the essence of what we do, uh, and it's very difficult. And we and we do it in a very imperfect way. I mean, it's far from perfect, but uh, you know, we're not we're not we don't exist to to be the mouthpiece of government. But we will sit through a press conference. When the president makes us wait three or four hours before he makes a statement late in the evening, we wait up for that. All of us wait up for that. Uh, and then we, you know, we try to synthesize that with the other information that we get. Okay, that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, that we, we still stand for the truth. No? Um, and then, um, well, that ends our question and answer. I'm, I know we've gone over time. Thank you to our speakers for an engaging discussion. And thank you for your time and patience with us no, and sharing us uh, with all of your experience and knowledge. To formally close today's general membership meeting, may I call once again Phoenix President uh, Jeng Pascual to adjourn this meeting. Um, thank you very much, uh, George. Uh, but before I adjourn the meeting, I'd like to also extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Edsel Silvania and uh, Mr. Howie Severino for sharing their stories and, and arming us all with the, the facts on, on COVID-19 uh, and uh, for busting a few myths that, uh, that, we, that emerge in, in some of the questions. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I'd like to also thank uh, George for, for uh, moderating the, the Q&A today and to Nanette and the rest of the programs and meetings uh, committee for arranging another relevant uh, gem -in. So I hereby adjourn this meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. That ends our session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.